You are special. We're here to take care. It's going well. And I want to thank you for coming out. Thank you, everybody. What a crowd. What a turnout. I will tell you, this is historic. It's epic what happened. But you know what? It happened in Texas, and Texas can handle anything. Trump famously bragged about his crowd size while touring disaster struck Houston and gave himself an A-plus for the government's response to Hurricane Harvey. But when I was in Houston one month after the historic storm, I saw entire neighborhoods where people were living in gutted out, moldy homes. Residents who I spoke to told me that they were denied all aid, despite Congress authorizing $15 billion for Harvey victims. So how is the void filled when these relief institutions are clearly failing millions of Texans? with volunteers, thousands of them, who spontaneously came to help. To learn more, I sat down with Scott Crow, anarchist co-founder of the Common Ground Collective. Let's talk about Hurricane Harvey. Uh, we're in Houston right now. What are some of the actions that decentralized groups um, have done with disaster relief here in the aftermath of the hurricane? Well, basically rebuilding civil society from the search and rescue at the, in the immediate aftermath, um, even getting ready before that, um, and then then moving to uh, the rebuilding phases. And so you had a disaster response, and then and then you move to the rebuilding. So people have been at all levels. They've been running clinics. They've been doing food distribution, the, the basic things to help people get a leg back up again. Um, and then additionally, one of the things they've been doing is they've been using these solidarity networks that have been built around the country after Hurricane Katrina. And so a lot of supplies and people and resources have been coming in to help those who have been uh, kind of forgotten about in the larger equation. To see how this works, I met with one group who came from out of state. Natalie and Michael have been driving around Houston in this van, doing direct action in the hardest hit communities. I met them in a Lakewood parking lot and spent the day with them distributing supplies they collected. So Natalie, how did you and Michael come together and form this autonomous group? Well, Michael and I have been friends on just Facebook. We found each other just through different groups that we are, have like, you know, in common. My friends and family, I just see them on Facebook. As this thing is unfolding, you know, showing us videos and, and just talking about what they're experiencing, flooding and just everything. They're just losing everything right in front of us. And so a girlfriend of mine that's also from here, um, but we just were messaging like, yeah, we need to do this. Like, let's get together. Let's, let's start a group. Let's do a fundraiser. Let's try to organize supplies. And everything just kind of fell into place after that. So people have been actually donating to just different, very small grassroots organizations and, and groups. And people have been donating. And I'm talking about thousands of dollars. I remember one day we woke up and we were uh, coming here hauling ass. We have an RV that is is inverted because it's so heavy and packed with shit that people have already donated because we, what we call scribe, put our right, right on the windows what we're doing. And people are walking up to the car, here's five, $50, $5, $100. And we're just like, oh my God, people really did come out for this. And I'm not gonna bash, I'm not gonna sit here and bash the, the, you know, the service sector, the so-called service sector. I'm just gonna say the people were called upon this time and the people responded and the people are not getting paid to. I asked Natalie what we were on our way to do. We picked up just some basic stuff. We're gonna go out there and see if people need water, socks, just some basic things um, and also find out who might need what, you know, and what other needs that, that, that they might have. We don't wanna just see the city be rebuilt. We don't wanna see things just go back to square one. We want to see the people who were in need even before this devastation, um, that they also get help. It's not okay that we have a lot of empty homes and, and people living on the street. Nobody's coming out to tell them. I'm, I'm walking up to random people who are outside of their homes. I'm like, has anybody told you when you guys are gonna have regular trash pickup? When are you gonna have regular trash pickup? When are you, when have they told you when you're gonna have people come in for your walls and your, these are apartment complexes. And they say, we haven't been told anything. And this is after a week after the, after the floods have receded and stuff like that. And when you look at the, we talk to the families, they, they don't know they're, they don't know what's going on, so they don't even know what to do with themselves. And they're huddled in their homes, and they have no power, and they're in need of mattresses. These are some of the things I've heard, mattresses, 
um, diapers, which we have, uh, we've been giving out a lot of this stuff. So what happens if you lose your home? Like you're, you're living in this neighborhood, you lose your home, you're probably, if you're living here, maybe undocumented or, or immigrant or minority community, what assistance did they have? What steps can you take to get any sort of... I don't think anybody is sure other than um, trying to link up with an individual or a, you know, a group that's established themselves through this whole thing um, because the majority of the people that are out here are just people. On the outskirts of Houston, I visited the Altruist Relief Kitchen, another traveling group that provides basic necessities to people in emergency situations. Lucid, tell us about uh, the community, how you guys got together, and why you're here in Houston. So Altruist Relief Kitchen is a grassroots field kitchen providing emergency free hot meals to the people affected by the hurricane. So we're kind of responding to this uh, environmental chaos that's being put forth by these terrible policies, and we're like cleaning up some of the symptoms on the side. And how does it work? How, how do different people come together and actually distribute food in mass like this? Well, we're actually from all over the country. Each one of us is probably from a different state and we just come together. We've been traveling around for uh, a few years, some of us. Uh, I was in Syrian refugee camps just uh, earlier this year with my girlfriend and we uh, responded to uh, Standing Rock. We were uh, responding to other floods last year. So wherever there seems to be a need for activism, for awareness, for uh, just grassroots serving of meals, we try to show up. And how long have you guys been here? How long are you planning to stay here? So we've uh, been bouncing around. We're, we've been set up in this new location for about a week, but we've been feeding here for about three weeks in Houston. Um, but we're, we're planning to stay as long as the, the resources and the need is here. So it could be uh, months while people are rebuilding their communities because a lot of the people here don't have the financial resources to rebuild quickly. And so by alleviating that financial burden of meals, we're able to kind of like remo reduce that stress for them. Millions of Americans would look at you guys and say, you're crazy. Um, people should just work harder to feed themselves. Food is not a human right. Health is not a human right. What's your response to those people? Oh man, um, well the way that the, this, this society has been set up, it's like a, a global civilization that's parasitizing the poorest people and the ecosystem to create this monstrosity, this death machine. And the people that fall through the cracks, the people that are either born into poverty or that don't have the weight of getting proper documentation, they're, the, they're holding this thing up through uh, essentially slavery. And they're the ones that are neglected in the social programs that this global civilization is putting out anyway. So uh, it's easy to forget about the people born into abject poverty because you can stay on the highways and avoid them. But the, the majority of this planet is the people that are born into slavery that are maintaining the illusion of stability within civilization. And so we're addressing that need by going directly to the poorest places. And still, you've dedicated your life, so many of you guys have dedicated your life to doing this. Why? Why are you doing this when you could be traveling around the world, going on vacation? Why do this, Lucid? Well, this, there's, there's one aspect here where we are, we're providing free hot meals for people. We're trying to alleviate that financial burden. But there's this other aspect where we are uh, showing, we're creating this demonstration of how to be beneficial. We are like motivating people to want to be beneficial and to want to engage in this global civilization and create positive change. But then we're trying to provide some sort of a concrete mechanism for them to go about that. So it's, it's more than just providing meals temporarily in this place. We're trying to show that it's possible for individual people with very little resources to engage in such a way that you really can create lasting change. I also spoke to Nisi of the Dallas-based Black Women's Defense League, an organization that assists underserved communities of color, particularly Black and trans women. I first asked Nisi what barriers she's encountered that prevents people from getting aid. There are people who have child sex trafficking um, cases or things like that because they were sex trafficked and that same person um, would be ineligible to stay in some of like the Red Cross or FEMA shelters um, that exist um, and so we try to provide resources past that um, and try to move into areas where people aren't looking um, and make sure that everybody is okay and we work with black women specifically with families of people um, and provide resources with really without all of like the paperwork I think that when you provide direct aid people ask all the time they're just like well 
how do I know that my funding or my donation is going to go to the right person if I don't give it to like this massive organization? And the quickest way for you to get it to the right person is for you to hand it to them. Talk about the projects, this decentralized effort, um, and different initiatives that you've taken already around the city working with these people. So something that we're working on um, here recently has been a work program. There's lots of houses that need gutting. There's lots of people who need triaging, which is basically we're going through communities, assessing needs, putting it into a graph form so that as we do get additional help coming through, that we have a clear pathway to get that help to the direct to the people who are needing it. Um, and so we've been offering opportunities for folks who are looking for jobs, looking for work, people whose workplaces were flooded or they're or in some situation otherwise um, and providing them you know with money daily to go and do these things that need to be done but also giving them the tools um, to really understand that this isn't like a general like I worked eight hours today I got this money but that it's part of a communal effort that really has to be cyclic and that we are working to institutionalize this community care this amount of support that we get after a hurricane but that it's something that's happening on a day-to-day -day basis that people recognize and see someone else's needs um, and are willing to intercede and not feel like you have to have a special badge on to do some work or whatever we go around all the time and people ask and they're like who are you with what what's your work and i'm just like black women's defense league i guess you know but it's just like it seems very odd that like someone would go out of their way to do something for someone without being signed off by some capitalist institution and um we're also just going and finding people who don't like elderly people who don't who wouldn't be able to fix their homes otherwise making sure that they have crews come in we've been doing a revolutionary rebuild of houston but we have people come out over the weekend medics counselors construction worker people people to distribute goods and food that's another project that we're working on which is kind of building propaganda campaigns letting people know and get knowledge about their home values letting them know not to sell and working to make sure that we're able to assist them with the needs that they have that might lead them to sell we're already starting to see the we buy ugly home signs popping up we'll buy your house really quick three-day process it has a nice little friendly 1-800 number on it but that's how gentrification occurs these companies buy up houses house after house after house on a block and all of a sudden two years later you have a Starbucks there this happened during Katrina in Louisiana and so we're aware of it um, and we're working to eliminate that as well the city center looks nice you know they've cleaned up all of the big banks and all of these different areas downtown but when you go off of homestead there's apartments where people are still paying rent every day um, and their apartments look like shanty towns like there's nothing they're still uh, breathing in mold and all types of other different things and so it's just not over with um, and we have to make sure that we continue to shine that light in those areas that um, they want to keep dark why do you have to do this? Why has have these institutions failed so miserably and the government? I mean, this is insane. I think that trauma that happens within capitalist uh, societies is a little different. It's because you are always constantly expected to provide for self. And in a moment where no one can provide for self, that's when we start to get into more communi communistic you know, ways of living. But it's also a lot easier to kind of exist in that way. And so I'm I'm doing this because I know that we have to. You know, I know that there will be no other help coming. And so it's not because I think I'm a superhero or that I got like some type of falling or whatever. It's literally because there's nobody else who's coming. And you have said disasters reveal the failure of capitalism and governments more than anything else. And talk about why. An immediate disaster, whether it's ecological, economic, political, or war, I consider all of those disasters, they begin to show that there's nothing, there's nobody there for you. When, when a disaster bears down on you and you lose everything and you see that there's no help coming to, from anybody except your neighbors, then that, that, that's why it reveals more than that. And then as the, after the disaster pass, passes, you still begin to see in the, the days, then the weeks, and the months, how there is still no support for, for the people that they supposedly are there to, to protect and serve. The countless volunteers from out of city worked with Houston's community leaders, who had created their own spontaneous response to Hurricane Harvey. 
To hear from them, I visited the Shape Center, a hub of grassroots organizing in Houston. They held a town hall organized by P.K. McCary to share their experiences after the storm. I saw so many leaders come together at this time. Uh, Ms. P.K., I mean, she, she called me and she said, Joseph, do your people need food? I said, yes, ma'am, they do. Um, could you? And she said, well, I'll have somebody to call you and they'll be on the way. And I tell you, within an hour, we had people with food uh, who had no food. Um, uh, my, inner, my social media uh, was just full. People were saying, Joseph, we have people at such and such XYZ address. We have senior citizens, a uh, grandmother with four kids, and the, they have four feet of water in their house, and no one is here at all. During this time on social media, it was like this chaos. Mm -hmm recovery system. And I don't say that in a bad way. I mean that in the most positive uh, manner. I'm not talking about government. I'm talking about people. Um, folks were posting, like, maybe it would be like five numbers, right? Call this number, right? This is the uh, Naval Guard, whoever, name a group, right? Uh, name a bureaucracy, and they'll save you, right? But folks who were calling the numbers, no one could get through. We set up a Google uh, number uh, for folks who needed if they had some sort of something they needed, you know, uh, we gave that number out. We called it BLM HTX Harvey Hotline. Um, we set up a, <coughs> a volunteer, a link for volunteers, a link for sort of assessments for folks who needed trouble, I mean, who were in trouble. And what we've done is created a call center. And this call center, what we do is people will call in, whatever their needs are, we try to do our best to address those needs. We're always needing volunteers and so, because we felt that there were going to be people out there after the initial, there were still going to be people out here that people may not know about, can't get to, but if they call that number, we can direct them and we try to have different people across uh, the city. Uh, we just finished taking, sending some trucks to Dickerson, uh, which no people realize they have, they are just totally, they were totally underwater. Uh, and so there's just so many other areas that people aren't aware that people are still struggling. And so with this call center, that allows them to call in and to con continue to do, do the work. Many of the residents, they had to take the debris out on their own. And so another lady described to me that, look, you know, there are elderly people here who are incapable of doing this. And then I talk with able-bodied men who are angry, stating that, you know, the, the landlord, the owner is going to get money uh, for this. Insurance money, FEMA money, something. And they expect us to volunteer and help all these people. It's just not right. Uh, to, to speak to the spirit of community, I saw a lot of small churches and organizations uh, out there saying, we're just not going to let people starve. We're just not going to let people go without. And there were a number of groups. But then there were other people who were very angry, saying a lot of the management in various complexes, they don't want these people on their property at all. And so a lady, she took me to the back and showed me how uh, these people came from Oklahoma, I believe, to donate clothes and and how, according to her, uh, the property manager just threw them all in a dumpster. And so, you know, I, I, I was just horrified of that. So the people were just out there, you know, digging the clothes out of the dumpster. And she's like, why couldn't this have been better coordinated? You know, why won't they let us... Uh, have the things that the people want us to have. And maybe it's because he's evicted them and he wants them to go, I don't know. I, I believe that uh, we, as human beings, we can do better. I don't really care what the city doesn't do or the government, I don't, I, not anymore. I think that we have the capability of having our own plan in our communities because everything is local anyway. I'll, I'll just say this. I think we're asking sometimes the wrong question. Why isn't the government doing what it needs to do? And I'm going like, when has the government done what it was supposed to do, except for when people do it? Mm -hmm. they're, they're the ones that make it happen, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you don't request that the d government do X, Y, Z. You demand it. There's no vacation for us and there's no 401k at the end of our giving. Mm -hmm. But I cannot continue 
buying into the system of Democrats versus Republicans, for instance, and building communities that are having the forces of those developers or those people with greed who don't recognize humanity pushing at it, it's tiring and it's toxic. So I don't have all the answers, but I know from day one from Harvey before Harvey started and while Harvey was doing, there were people we were working. Another problem, and you'll see this everywhere uh, among the coast, right? Oil industries, gas towns, it's harder to radicalize communities who are involved in the industry. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who are maybe consciously aware of the negative impacts that their corporation or their job, their livelihood has on the planet and on social structures, um, I think those who are aware of that really do want to create some type of change or be a part of that productiveness uh, to progress the country forward. But, you know, when you have your livelihood based upon that, for some people that's a real struggle. And um, so it gets back to an economic justice issue to where, you know, we need to create a system where people can live on the earth without making such a harmful impact on the earth, you know. We need to be bold and say, um, the system that we have doesn't work. We need to get rid of it. We need to create a decentralized structure and um, really allow the people who are skillful people in these areas of environmental justice, economic justice, war and militarism, to be at the forefront to say, hey, this is how we want to reimagine our way of being and let's create it together.